to Titus. And looking at Titus chapter 3. And if you don't mind, I'd like to read the first few verses. Titus chapter 3, starting at verse 1. Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work. They must not slander anyone, but be peaceable, gentle, showing complete courtesy to all people. For we too were once foolish, disobedient, misled, enslaved to various passions and desires, spending our lives in evil and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness of God, our Savior, and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not by works of righteousness that we have done on the basis of his mercy through the washing of the new birth and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us in full measure through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And so, since we have been justified by his grace, we become heirs with the confident expectation of eternal life. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the gift that you've given us to send your son in the flesh to die on the cross in our place. Father, because of that, we have eternal life. And because we have eternal life, we could never die. Father, thank you so much for the grace that you've given us. It's a gift that we cannot boast. And it's something, Father, that's humbling. And Father, just a privilege to be part of your family. And because of that, Father, we serve you. We love you. We want to be obedient to you. We ask, Father, you give us the strength. I ask, Father, for those that could not be here today. So many, Father, uh, that I think of B. Madrano and Johnny Salazar, and I'm sure there are many more that are, are working with uh, challenges and things going on that I just, uh, Father, teach us to, to just really keep them in prayer. And I pray, Father, that your hand of comfort would be upon them. I think of Bertha's sister and the different praise from her surgery and uh, so many more, Father, that are, are struggling and some uh, even uh, having harder times, Father. And I just ask, as they're away from us, Father, that you would still give them the comfort and the peace and the fellowship that comes from this little small family. Thank you, Father, for this time. I ask that your spirit would guide us, keep us within truth, and I pray, Father, that what we say and what we do would be honoring and pleasing in your ear. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. As you can tell, I'm not Raul. He does a much better job at announcing. But Raul will be up here to give us uh, God's word this morning. A um, couple of announcements. Uh, tonight at 6 p.m., we have our Sunday adult Bible study. This is entirely online. And uh, if there was a verse that I could think of that would describe the Sunday night Bible study, it would be Acts chapter 17, verse 11. That's where... The, that they had commissioned everyone that heard them to test what they were saying with the scriptures. And they said, do it every day. The way we approach the Sunday night is we actually are using a book written by, uh, is a pretty popular Christian uh, guy on the radio. He has a radio ministry. Um, and he goes over basic Christian principles. And what we do is we read through them and we challenge them. Are they true and are they not? with the scriptures and do you agree or you disagree and some of the conversations get pretty animated but uh, what what I enjoy and if you've never sat with Robert Smith who's one of our deacons here the guy is amazing in the original Greek languages and uh, he can read it and he can translate it which sometimes I'll ask him hey, what does that really mean and what's fascinating is he'll tell you what the original languages say and what's even more surprising sometimes is when he says, it doesn't say this. And oftentimes when we rapidly read through English translations, we form our own ideas. And sometimes it doesn't say that. So it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, it's, uh, we sometimes have 12, 
10 or 12 people in there. It's, it's really fun. And everybody participates, which I think is fascinating. If you don't uh, know, it's, there's a URL to get into the Zoom meeting. And it starts at 6 p.m. If you don't have it, I can give it to you. So just ask me. Um, or it's in an email, which I send out. Which, by the way, if you're not on the email list, uh, let me know. Give me your email address, and I'll make sure that you know what's going on here at the church. Tuesday nights, uh, the women's the women's prayer meeting. They, they get together also on Zoom, and they will fellowship and share uh, prayer requests amongst themselves. And uh, if you would like to join that, uh, if you're a woman, that's men can't join that. But uh, if you would like to join that, uh, uh, please let me know. Um, or Raul, uh, Raul is a, his wife Lydia is the one who actually hosts that meeting for for the ladies. So that's on 6 p.m. on Tuesday nights. Uh, Wednesday night, uh, lots of things happen on Wednesday night. Uh, Pastor Abeda actually has his uh, midweek Bible studies, which he does at 7 p.m. He does that from here. Uh, it's also on Facebook, so you can watch that there. Um, and uh, in addition to that, Michelle Ceballos is actually running the uh, Awana program here uh, on the campus. So uh, if you want to uh, uh, participate in that or want to have your children participate in that, please see Michelle and uh, she will set you up right. Uh, prayer requests, uh, as I mentioned earlier, one is for uh, B. Madrano, that uh, she have quick recovery, and also for Johnny Salazar, whom uh, we miss both of them. Uh, it's been a while since we've seen them, and I just pray that uh, we lift them up together in prayer so that they can have a speedy recovery. And I would also, uh, lastly, uh, pray for a pastor who is uh, in Wisconsin with, uh, with Jonathan. And uh, I think the high temperature over there today is going to be minus nine degrees. So uh, that's for the love of hockey. It's a <laughs> so uh, d d definitely uh, pray that uh, they, they have a fun time together, father and son, and that they would come back to us safely. Um, and with that, I'd like to conclude. And uh, let me. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Um, it's, uh, um, <laughs> Yes, I'd forgotten. My, uh, uh, up here in the front is my friend Anna Rosselli, and uh, she was a college classmate of Anne's, and uh, she's been a longtime dear friend of ours, very talented performer and actress, so, uh, and uh, we just love just seeing her again, so it was a fun time to actually just be able to see her again. So anyways, please welcome Anna Rosselli. Is there anyone else here who's been here for the first time? Okay, terrific. But, uh, thank you for joining, and I would like to introduce our speaker this morning, our own brother, Raul Caracosa. You did? <laughs> Well, it's a pleasure to be up here. Pastor couldn't uh, make it, as uh, Brother Les said. He's out in Wisconsin, so he asked me to fill in for him, and it's, it's always a pleasure to share the Word of God with God's people. Amen. Let us open in a, our Bibles now. We're going to open our Bibles to the book of Matthew. Chapter 14, verse 22. And it says this, Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he sent the crowds away. And after he had sent the crowds away, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone. But the boat was already a long distance from the land, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. 
And he, Jesus, said, Immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind stopped. And those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Let us bow. Father, we thank you for your word and we pray this morning that those who are here in attendance and those, Lord, who are with us online, that they be blessed by your message. And Father, we thank you for it is appropriate, Lord, for the song that the worship team sang, for we wish that after hearing your word and drawing closer to you, that all would be well with our soul. So, Father, bless this time in your word. We pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and God's people said, Amen. Amen. If you have turned on your television, and who hasn't? Your radio, if, who, if you still use one, I don't know if any, many people still use a radio. Your computer, your tablet, your smartphone, or any other device that gives us news. You have been bombarded by the negative news about the state of our nation and a world in chaos. It is almost next to impossible not to be constantly reminded of the division in our country, the turmoil that exists, the protests and the riots that happen on a regular basis, the lockdowns, the stay-at-home orders, the orders of how the church can meet. And of course, all the negative news we hear and the fear that we have when we hear what is reported about the COVID virus. And it seems like all these things happened overnight, doesn't it? Everything was well and now it isn't. And it seems like there is no end to these things on the horizon. And with all this negative reporting, it is easy to get fixated on these things, the politics and the policies of our nations, and get really angry. Some Christians are, are full of anger that our candidate wasn't voted into office. And they keep that fear with them, that anger with them. Many Christians are so worried about the COVID virus that we are not just cautious and careful about where we go, who we meet, and how we do things. But we allow the fear to have such a tight grip on our lives that we are no longer in control of ourselves, but have allowed that fear to control us. Others may even focus on the protests and the riots and the civil unrest that is happening in many of the cities, including Los Angeles, and worry, will this happen somewhere close to our home? Constantly looking and hearing about these, these events and others like them can cause us to fear, sink into depression, get anxious, feel, feel anger, and may lead some Christians, some of God's people, to question if God is really in control. And here's our pra prayers, thinking, why would God allow all this to happen? But I say to you, I submit to you, that these fears, this anger, these worries, these anxieties, and these doubts are happening to God's people because we have our eyes fixated on the wrong thing. We are allowing them to determine how we think, how we act, and how we feel. 
Our eyes should not be centered on the things of the world and the circumstances around us that cause us to act like people who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ and have no hope. No. Our focus should be on the Word of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We should not be led by external influences that, that are temporal and one day will end. We need to be led by the Spirit of God who points us to Christ Jesus and eternal life in heaven. That's where our focus should be. I by no way mean that we should not be informed of the things happening around us. That wouldn't be wise. That would be foolish. We should be informed so that we may make wise decisions on matters that affect our lives so that we can move in a proper way and act accordingly. It is important that we understand that there are many good things to do in this life. Many good things, but there is only one best thing. And that best thing is Jesus Christ our Lord and the Word of God. We must not and cannot allow our focus on the storms and struggles of the present time as real as they may be, and they are real, to replace our time in God's Word and keep us from praying in our time of need and keep us from praying for one another. And we must not allow them to, allow, to make us question our faith. As children of God, it is important that we are not controlled by our surrounding circumstances or give them a chance to keep us from remembering and believing without doubt who Jesus Christ is and the promises he has made to his believers, to his followers, to those that are his. If we spend more time listening to the news than we spend in our Bibles, how can we have peace in the midst of the storm that surrounds us? Who then is our help in the time of trouble and chaos? So let us look at some of the valuable lessons, and there are many that will help us navigate through these difficult times Lessons that are found in Matthew 14 that we just read. Lesson number one, Jesus is aware of our troubles. Jesus is aware of our troubles. Matthew 14, verse 24. But the boat was already a long distance from the land, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. Turn with me to Mark chapter 6. It is the same account of Jesus walking on water, but it gives a little bit more detail. Mark 6, verse 47. It says, when it was evening, the boat was in the middle of the sea. That's about two to three miles from shore. And he, Jesus, was alone on the land. Seeing them, straining at the oars, for the wind was against them at about the fourth watch of the night, that's about three to six in the morning, he came to them walking on the sea, and he intended to pass by them. Jesus was on the shore, Yet he saw what was happening to them in the middle of the sea. He saw the troubles that surrounded them. He saw the storm that surrounded them. You see, Jesus is omniscient. He knows all things. He is omnipresent. Meaning that all things are before him and he is before all things. Nothing is hidden from his sight. There is nothing he doesn't know. And while still standing on land, Jesus saw that the disciples were in trouble. Even though they were in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. And he came to them. 
Do we not think that he is not aware of our problems? Do we believe that he doesn't know what we're going through? What surrounds us? And that he is mindful of all the storms that affect our lives? And that our Lord and Savior will not help us in a time of need? Do we really believe that? Because if we have worry and we have anxiety and we have fear and we have all these other things, what we're saying is, no, we don't believe it. We must, without a doubt, know that Jesus sees the things we're going through. And because he sees the things we're going through, lesson number two is, Followers of Jesus need not fear. Matthew 14, verse 26 says, When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. This message, do not fear, fear not, do not be afraid, is repeated to us many times in the Old and the New Testament. Is it not? Mm -hmm. Have we read it? God continually tells us, don't fear, don't be afraid. And you know why we should never be afraid? Because we don't go through any struggles alone. Whether we forget, omit, don't believe, we are not going to go through any struggles alone. Turn with me, if you would, to Hebrews, the book of Hebrews. Hebrews uh, 13. And verse 5. It says this, Make sure... Make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, what? I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. So that we confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? What is the worst that man can do to us? And that's take our lives. But the Apostle Paul tells us a truth we shouldn't forget. To be absent from the body is to be where? Present, present with the Lord. Amen? Amen? In His presence. Now that doesn't mean we should go and jump off a bridge to test it and be with God. We go in His time. But to be absent from the body, we will be present with the Lord. Do not be afraid. Psalms 23, 4 tells us that God is our comfort during tough times. And Philippians 4, 6, and 7, and John 14, 27 tell us that the Word of God de declares to us that Jesus gives us His peace. It's a peace that the world does not and cannot know. It is a peace that surpasses all understanding and it calms our hearts. If we know that Jesus is with us and He is our peace and our comfort, why do some of us fear? Why do some of us fear? Do not be afraid. Lesson number three, you have been called by Jesus. What an awesome and, 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 and privilege and, and blessing it is to be called by Jesus. Because he called you not by anything that you or I did. He called you by His good pleasure and for His glory. Matthew 14, verse 28. Back in Matthew 14. Verse 28. 
Verse 28 says, Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he, Jesus said, come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. In God's word, we see that Peter, that Jesus called Peter to himself. And Peter got out of the boat and walked through the storm. And just as God, as Jesus has called Peter to himself, he has called you and I, if you are a believer in Christ. What did he call us out of? He called us out of darkness. You see, we could never see the glory of the Father in the Son because the God of this world had blinded us. But Jesus, through his grace and his mercy, he took those blinders off and he allowed us to see the glory of the Father in the Son and confess that Jesus is Lord. Turn with me, please, to 1 Peter. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. And it says that about us. It says, but you are a chosen race. You were chosen. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. His marvelous light. We have no light of our own. Our deeds are but filthy rags. We were called into his marvelous light. And when we are dominated by worry, anxiety, and fear, the light of Christ is dimmed in us. And there can only be darkness. But it, this is the darkness that God has called us out of. Matthew 5.16 says, Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father is in heaven. If we constantly walk around with worry, fret, fear, anxiety, depression, how can others see the light of Christ in us and give glory to God? We've been called out of darkness and into the light. And we have also been called to be conformed to the image of His Son. We have been called to be sanctified. In other words, apart from the world and chosen and called to God. We have been called into his kingdom and his glory. And we've been called by his glory and his excellence. And the word, excuse me, the word of God tells us, it declares that the called will be raised on the last day. We'll be raised in the heaven. Put that in, we are finite, so we can't understand the things of heaven. I can't understand everlasting and eternal. That's too, that's too much for me to get in here. I'm a little bit thick up here. I'm a finite being. I'm limited into what I can reach, but God isn't. And all I need to know is that He's my God. Lesson number four. Keeping our eyes on Jesus will allow us to persevere during the stormy times of our lives. Matthew 14, verse 29. And He said, Come, and Peter got out of the boat and walked on water and came toward Jesus. You see, Jesus called Peter to come to him in the middle of the storm. He didn't calm the storm first. If you read the text, he didn't, the storm was still going on. It was still raging. 
Jesus could have calmed the storm first. He didn't do that. The storm was still ongoing. And Jesus said, come. And Peter came. In the middle of the storm and in the middle of the sea, he walked on water. And as long as his focus was on the Lord, he was able to walk on water, able to overcome the sea, the turbulent waves, the storm, and any doubts that may have entered his mind that would have hindered him from coming to Jesus. He laid aside all obstacles and was not controlled by the chaos around him and because of his faith was able to walk on water. Do you want to walk on water? I do. And I mean that metaphorically. I want to come to Jesus. But we can't allow other things to hinder our walk. Turn with me if you would again to Hebrews. This time chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 says, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance a race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. The great cloud of witnesses are, exam are examples of Old Testament men and women who are listed in chapter 11 of Hebrews. Who are commended for their perseverance and their faith despite experiencing many hard and unimaginable obstacles. They, they persevered during their lives in obedience to God in spite of these things. And in verse 3, it says, For consider him, consider who? Who's him? Jesus, who endured such hostility by sinners against himself. He is the ultimate example of perseverance. As he endured the hostility, the ridicule, and the hatred that was thrown at him by mankind. And he endured all the way to the cross. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 12 is instructing his fellow Jews and us to follow the example of these witnesses and lay aside every sin and anything that would cause us to stumble and fall and keep us from running with determination the race that is set before us. And you ask, what race? What is the race that is set before us? It's the race that is established by God for those who are called to be conformed to the image of His Son. Jesus is the author of our faith, the sustainer of our faith, the goal of our faith, and it is to Him that we run to. He is our finish line. And this race is not a sprint. It's not something that you just confess Jesus is Lord and that's it. You can let, you know, uh, what is that saying? Let go and let God. It's, that's not something that you do. That is not biblical. We are called to work out our salvation. To grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. This race is more of a marathon slash steeplechase. You guys know what it's, you've seen the steeplechase in the Olympics? There's barriers and ponds and things that all these runners run a long, long distance and they have obstacles in their way. 
It is a lifelong race with many obstacles that can trip up a Christian and make him or her stumble and possibly even quit the race. Will you quit? Or will you persevere? If we keep our eyes on Jesus and not be consumed by the peripheral things of the world, we can be overcomers like Peter walking on water and respond properly to the call of our Lord to run the good race of our Christian life, not losing our focus and always striving to run toward Him. Amen. Turn with me to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy verse 4, something that most of us are familiar with. It's a verse, but it's worth... 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse... Oh, uh, is it second? Verse 6. I got the wrong reference, so I apologize for that. But it's, it's a verse that said that the apostles did not compare the trials that they were going through in the present time compared to the blessings that they would be receiving in the future. You see, their eyes were not on the present um, struggles of the time. But their focus was on the rewards of the future. And I apologize for having the, the, uh, the wrong reference here. Lesson number five. Focusing, our troubles, focusing on our troubles will cause us to drown under the pressure of our problems. Matthew 14. Back in Matthew 14. Verse 30. But seeing the wind, here we go. It says that Jeter, Jesus, uh, Peter was walking toward Jesus. Didn't say he got to him. It said he was walking toward Jesus. And verse 30 says, but seeing the wind, he became frightened and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Peter took his eyes off of Jesus and he immediately was in trouble. His focus turned from Jesus. He was here. Straight to Jesus and he can walk. But then he started noticing here and there. He turned his TV on and he got the bad news that there was a choppy winds and, and, and you know, uh, uh, strong winds and choppy waves, right? And that's what he focused on. He turned his TV on. He turned his computer on. He was constantly on his phone, phone seeing what the pol political landscape was. That's what he focused on. And he began to sink. He got in trouble. And soon he began to sink into the sea and he was filled with panic and despair and cried out for help. When we sink into the sea of everything that is reported, eventually we're going to have to cry out with panic and despair as, uh, as Peter did. However true they may be, allowing the reports about politics, civil unrest, deaths and illnesses due to the COVID virus, unemployment or any other of life's troubles, to be what influences how we live our lives, what we believe the future holds, If we believe these things and allow them to dictate that for us, we are showing lack of a faith. We are showing lack of faith in the person and promises of our Lord Jesus Christ. A Christian filled with a life of worry 
despair, depression, anxiety, anger, and the uncertainties that filter into the minds of some by the constant watching of this news will allow this will allow this priority to take over the daily reading of the Bible. In other words, you're no longer reading your Bible. There's dust on the cover of your Bible. There's nothing on the inside of your Bible. The pages aren't worn. You don't see the corners all bent. But what you do see is your fingerprints all over the remote. Your smudge marks on your smartphone. But your Bible, it looks pristine and clean. Because that's what we get fixated on at times. And when that happens, when a daily reading of the Bible and the, and the prayer are replaced with those things that often will cause believers in Christ to no longer attend church, either in person or online, or sometimes we even get part-time attenders. And soon, they fall away. Not only from church, but from He who called them into eternal life. Lesson number six, we must not forget the person and works of Jesus Christ. Matthew 14, 31. Immediately, Jesus stretched out His hand and took hold of Him. That's Paul when he was sinking and said, You of little faith, why did you doubt? After Peter was sinking into the sea and he cried out for help, and Jesus saved him from going under, Jesus then questions the faith of Peter and asks him why he doubted. In Mark's account, in Mark's account, of Jesus walking on water, we get a little bit more detail as to why the apostles were afraid and why possibly Peter doubted. Turn with me again to Mark chapter 6, I'm sorry, and uh, verse 51. And it says this, Then he got into the boat. Jesus got into the boat with them. It's the same account now being reported. And the wind stopped, and they were utterly astonished. And here it is, verse 52. For they had not gained any insight from the incident of the loaves, but their heart was hardened. You see, before the apostles had sailed off to the other, to the other side and got caught in the middle of the sea and were battered by the storm, they had just been with Jesus and had seen a large crowd gathering from the cities to the place where he had gone to be secluded. And there the apostles saw that Jesus was healing the sick of this large multitude that gathered. And when it became evening, they witnessed Jesus taking five loaves, five loaves of bread, and two fish, and feed 5,000 men who were present along with the women and children, estimated to be about 15 to 20,000 people who were fed with those loaves and that fish. And even after everyone ate, they still managed to pick up 12 full baskets of broken pieces of food. Yet Mark's account of Jesus walking on water tells us that when Jesus got into the boat with them they, and he calmed the storm, they were astonished. They were amazed. They were, they were surprised that Jesus was able to do this. How about us? Do we quickly forget what we have learned about our Lord? What we have been taught? What we have experienced in our lives? The changes that are made? How about our answered prayers. And did we forget our profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? 
Was it just, what do they call it, speak, uh, speak talk? Or there's a word for that that I forget. Was it just something we said but did not really believe? Does our faith waver, falter, and grow faint at the first hint of things that are not favorable for us? And not going the way we would like them to go. We're like a little bratty kid. We get angry because things didn't happen how we wanted them to happen. And we act in that, wor in that way. Do we worry, grow anxious, fret, and get depressed, and even fear about the things we cannot control? Forgetting that we know Him who is in control, and He knows us. I pray that we are not. And if we are struggling, and we are struggling in our faith, now is the time to get back in the boat with Jesus Christ. Amen. And let Him calm our storms. And the last lesson is Jesus is in control of all things. Back in Matthew 14, verse 32, it says, When he got in the boat, the wind stopped, and those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, You are certainly God's son. When Jesus got in the boat, the wind stopped. And the apostles... They knew then that Jesus was God. And we know that because they realized this, that they had realized this because they began to worship him. Yes, we need to be aware of the things happening around us. It is a bad thing to, have, to not have understanding of them. How else would we be prepared? Be, pre pre yeah. be prepared to ward off the schemes of the devil. And excuse me for stuttering sometimes. However, we should not be however we should be cautious to not to be consumed in all that is happening in the world to the point where we take that to the point where it takes us away from God and from the joy he gives us. John 15:11 Jesus says the things I have spoken to you so that you the things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. What joy? What joy can we have if we are always worried and fearful? They contradict one another. They are opposites. And it's ironic that I was going through Facebook and I read this quote. Worrying won't stop bad things from happening. It just stops you from enjoying the good. How true that is, isn't it? Does your worry, does your worry cure anything? Does your worry stop any struggles? Does your worry... Keep this from happening or that from happening? No, it just prevents you from enjoying the good. And Jesus says in 5, John 15, 19, If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world because of this, because he chose us out of the world, the world hates you. You're going to go through struggles because the world hates you. But if God is for you, who can be against you? Christians are promised eternal life. John 3.36 says, He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. The promises of God will not change. Of this you can be sure. You shouldn't doubt this. Malachi 3.6 says, For the I, the Lord... Do not change. And James 1.17 says, Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting of shadow. Our God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Why has God allowed all this chaos to happen in our nation and in the world? I don't know. God didn't tell me. I know he told you. He didn't tell me. But I do know what he's told me. He's told me in his word to trust him. 
Proverbs 3, chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 say, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. This is a verse many of us know. And do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. He will make your path straight. We are told to trust in the Lord not only in the times we understand or perceive to be good times. Hey, things are going well. I got a job. I, you know, I, I got money for this. I got money for that. So I'm going to trust in the Lord. Yeah, praise God. Praise God. But as soon as things go south, we stop doing that. He didn't say to trust Him only in the good times. We are to trust Him all the time. Even in those we think are bad. Knowing that he will direct our footsteps and the direction of our lives because he loves us. And the scriptures tell us that perfect love casts out fear. Do not be afraid. The things that bring fear, worry, despair will one day end. And be replaced by something or someone else. Even the President of the United States of America will relinquish his seat to another after his term is up. But for the Christian, we can be sure that our King, the Lord Jesus Christ, will be on his throne forever. Amen? Amen. Amen. He's going to be on the throne forever. So let us not focus on the things of this world, for they will one day end, for they are temporal. They are temporary. But instead, we should focus on the eternal word of God. The promises of eternal life. The joys of eternal peace. And a life everlasting with Jesus Christ, our Lord. I'm going to end by, as, as, uh, by calling uh, up the ushers as we get today's offering with a poem that was written by John Newton, the author, the writer of Amazing Grace. And the poem he wrote is, A word from Jesus calms the sea, the stormy wind controls, and gives rep response to liberty, the tempest-tossed soul. To Peter on the waves he came and gave him instant peace. Thus he said to me, revealed his name, and bid my sorrow cease. Then filled with wonder, joy, and love, Peter's request was mine. Lord, call me down, I long to prove that I am wholly thine. Unmoved at all I have to meet on life's temp tempestuous sea. Heart shall be easy, bittersweet, so I may follow thee. He heard and smiled and bid my tr me try. I eagerly obeyed. But when from him I turned my eye, how was my soul dismayed? The storm increased on every side. I felt my spirit shrink. And soon with Peter loud I cried, Lord, save me or I sink. Kindly he caught me by the hand and he said, Why dost thou fear? Since thou art come at my command, and I am always near. Upon my promise rest thy hope and keep my love in view. I stand engaged to hold thee up and guide thee safely through. Let us bow. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. And we pray, Lord, that your peace and your comfort, Lord, is what we are filled with. May your people, Lord, not fear and fret, but look. To you, Lord, our Savior, for you will save us from all our struggles. Bless the offering now, Lord. Bless the giver. And Father, may we use everything that we have, Lord, to honor and glorify you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.